Okay, we've come a long way through bacteria and some viruses, and we're back to viruses now, viruses of the lower respiratory system. And, um, well, let's get into it. Some of these are more serious uh, than the upper respiratory tract viruses. The first one we look at is a very common uh, virus that hasn't traditionally gotten a lot of attention, but should. It's the respiratory syncytial virus, and it's named that way because it causes a respiratory infection and it uh, forms syncytia in our tissues. Those are giant multinucleated cells, so that's just a thing it does to us, is it makes us make those giant cells. It's not that important, but um, what it does in newborns is cause pneumonia and um, a noticeable symptoms. It's the most common cause of pneumonia in newborns. It's, um, I think, the most common cause of respiratory infections. Yeah, it, most common cause of respiratory infections. So it is likely that a newborn will experience this. And um, it's important to recognize it. In case it gets worse, be able to describe um, what was going on to the clinicians. If you get it from a newborn and you're an adult, um, you will, if anything, get the common cold. It's only in very young children that it seems to be um, a big risk. So things that can happen to um, a child who gets it are involve croup, and this is inflammation of um, the airways um, that makes it hard to breathe because the airways swell a little bit. So um, if a person coughs, there's a higher pitch to it because the air has to move faster and it sounds more like bark and it's terrible. Um, or pneumonia. Pneumonia would be the worst um, of the typical complications. Treatment options are limited, but they exist. There is a monoclonal antibody um, that is produced by a pharmaceutical company you can buy. According to... Um, well, according to clinical microbiology book I have, they don't even mention this. According to our textbook, they mention it and say it costs $6,000, so it's only approved by insurance in extreme cases. And so in the worst cases, people will need fluids and ventilation. Um, shifting gears in a big way, here we are thinking of um, potentially imaginary viruses. Um, by that, I mean that viral pneumonia is sometimes um, what diseases are blamed on if we don't know what's causing them. So if no other cause can be identified, we can say, oh, it's some unknown virus. Maybe it's a relative of a virus we know, but we just, whatever, it's a virus. Why does this make sense? Well, there is a good reason for it. It's that in clinical labs, they, they have great abilities to identify bacteria, and they have great abilities to identify certain very specific uh, viruses when they need to. But in terms of discovering a new virus, they can't do it in a clinical lab. They, they wouldn't have um, the types of technologies that a research lab would use for this purpose. So a clinical lab won't be able to answer the question, what is causing this, if it's caused by an unknown virus. And so it's easy to say it is a unknown virus. Um, and for all I know, that could be the right answer. Just understand that viral pneumonia means we don't know what's causing it. Um, these unknown diseases are going to happen most often in people who are most susceptible to respiratory diseases. They are going to get the more rare infections. So if we have unknown viruses that typically couldn't make a healthy adult sick, we would only see them in um, populations who have uh, suppressed immune systems, such as very young children or older people with um, chronic respiratory problems. Influenza is a big deal, and I want you to understand about influenza why I take it seriously and why people in public health take influenza very seriously. Why are we always saying, go get your flu shot, go get your flu shot, and um, why are we talking about things like bird flu? Um, right now, people are social distancing um, 
because of COVID. And that's a pretty good way to prevent the spread of influenza. So we're not thinking, or we're not talking about influenza very much. Um, but I do want you to see what it is and understand how it can cause a pandemic and see what we are looking at with influenza. So influenza has um, the ability to make a person very sick and it's a respiratory infection. And it goes, um, in some cases, it can cause asymptomatic infections, and in other cases, it can kill a person. So, um, typically, a person would experience um, these symptoms. So, malaise and fever um, and, and aches, those are typical of influenza, just the feeling bad all over and feeling weird muscle aches, and feeling weird um, weird sense that everything is wrong. That's that malaise. Um, if influenza is going to kill a person, typically it's because of these complications. Viruses rarely kill people by lysing cells. I mean, that can happen, but usually they're going to do something else that ultimately leads to something like sepsis or... Um, organ failure. And what influenza can do, um, some strains of influenza and other viruses can cause cytokine storms or extremely overblown immune responses that can lead to essentially the same outcomes as sepsis. And another thing influenza can do is weaken the immune system um, that would normally be protecting the lungs and the airways. This isn't clear. It's not clear exactly how this happens, but it clearly does happen um, because in older people who get influenza, they then become much more susceptible to getting bacterial pneumonia. And that bacterial pneumonia can have its own complications. And so influenza can be the first in a cascade of medical problems, and none of those would have happened without the influenza going first. Um, Influenza is worse if people have um, respiratory conditions already, like asthma. Um, people with heart disease can experience heart damage from influenza. Very young children and older people are at risk from influenza also. That's the normal seasonal influenza. Pandemic influenza, like H1N1 or some of the other um, pandemic strains we've seen throughout history, they they tend to cause more damage in younger people, like teenagers and college students. Um, but the normal seasonal strains are worst for um, very young children and older people. If we need to, we can treat influenza with some specific antivirals. We have drugs called neuraminidase inhibitors. Remember, neuraminidase is one of the spike proteins. So, if a person takes a neuraminidase inhibitor, it greatly curtails influenza's replication. Um, and that stops the growth of the infection, um, and the immune system can calm down after that. Um, but we typically don't give those to people, um, to healthy people who get influenza. If a person's life is not in danger, we're going to think twice before giving them one of these because viruses evolve very quickly and um, <clears throat> strains will appear with resistance to these drugs very quickly if we use them a lot. So um, to some extent, we want to stockpile these in case of a big, fast outbreak of influenza where we need to treat a lot of people quickly. Um, but by far the best thing is prevention. Vaccination is the most important thing, um, but also all of the normal things that um, clinicians already do, like hand washing and never touching your face, um, being very careful what you eat, things like that, those can pr um, protect you from, from influenza. Um, this is about the vaccines. There are a lot of different influenza vaccines, and you can read about them. Um, but how do we know what is going to be in them? How do we decide what strain they're protecting us from? Well, I've had a lot of conversations with students about this, and so I, I looked into it. And 
Basically, there are two different series and decision-making processes about influenza vaccines. One is for the Northern Hemisphere, one is for the Southern Hemisphere. And that's because the Northern Hemisphere typically sees influenza outbreaks in the fall and winter, and same in the Southern Hemisphere, it's just fall and winter at a different time. So for us up here, um, we have our flu season, it kind of starts around September, um, and gets bad around November or December usually. Um, and so the World Health Organization convenes a meeting of national public health agencies like the CDC and whatever the um, counterpart of that is in other countries. They come together and pool data and try to predict what viruses will be bad in the coming year. So they do this in February trying to predict what will happen in November. So that is inherently a tricky thing, and it is not perfect, and they can't predict the future. But they can make the best predictions they can, and usually they're able to correctly identify which viruses seem to be spreading. Um, so for example, if a virus is spreading in January and February, but it hasn't yet gotten to a lot of the world, you can assume that that virus has the ability to spread in those parts of the world and will eventually. And so if, I know the examples I've seen in the past are, if there's a virus in China um, in February, we can expect to see that virus in September um, in a big way. There's any country that has a, giant cities that are crowded um, is a place where new um, virus strains can come from. And and so, yeah, so we would think, like, we'd watch China, we'd watch India, we'd watch a lot of other um, places that have lots of giant cities, um, very populous, crowded cities. And that's how we would know um, what strains to vaccinate against. So I want to review influenza structure. And before, we looked at it as an example of viral replication. And that's not what we're doing here. Um, but here, I want you to think of it as a disease and as a cause of uh, epidemics and pandemics. And so in order to do that, we need to think about the structures of the virion. So the big one is that influenza especially influenza A viruses, type A, they have an eight-segment genome. And each genome segment has one RNA molecule surrounded by um, capsomere proteins. So each, um, each one is called a nucleocapsid. And we'll come back to that. And then there are two types of spike protein. There's the um, hemagglutinin, and that's the one that's going to um, attach to the cell and help bring the envelope close to the cell so they can fuse and uh, um, this matrix can enter the cell. And then there's the neuraminidase, which is going to um, release the virion from those, those proteins on the way out of the cell. So these are the spike proteins. If we want to mount an immune response against influenza, we are mounting an immune response against these proteins. That's really what our um, adaptive immune systems are good at doing. They are good at seeing proteins. So, cool. That's what we are always looking at, the H and the N. That gives us the H1N1 or H5N1 types. Um, so the reason influenza keeps our attention is that it can cause pandemics and it can potentially cause pandemics a lot worse than what we're seeing with COVID. Um, but it hasn't done that in a long time. But I'm going to walk you through this. The reason influenza can cause pandemics and the reason we think of it as something that regularly causes pandemics um, every 15 years or so is that influenza can go through antigenic shift. So an antigen, remember, that's what the immune system will recognize, and the antigenic shift is just a big change in the antigens. So this works because 
influenza has a segmented genome, and you could think of it as chromosomes. You could think of the virion having eight chromosomes. Each one of them is necessary. Well, you can have two unrelated influenza strains that infect the same cell. So if someone is really unlucky and they have two influenza infections at the same time, which is absolutely possible, if they infect the same cell, they can swap genome segments. And so you can get um, a new influenza that has a combination of their genome segments. And that's going to lead to weird changes to the spike proteins. Um, and that is a big deal because that can generate a new virus. So this is the thing that causes the pandemics. There's also antigenic drift that changes viruses slowly over time. This is the constant mutation of all the viruses um, that makes us need a new vaccine every year. So antigenic drift is caused by random point mutations that are always accumulating in every virus. Um, but antigenic shift makes new influenza strains that no immune system has ever seen before. And so every time this happens, there's a possibility of a pandemic happening. And again, if you look up influenza pandemics, you will see every 10 to 15 years there has been a pandemic. They're not all big deals like COVID. Um, in a case like 20 or 2009, the H1N1 did kill people. It was worse than a seasonal influenza and it killed younger people than would typically have been at risk. Um, so it targeted a different population all over the world, and people who study viruses and the public health people definitely saw it happening. It caused unusually bad outbreaks in a lot of places, so some schools had to close temporarily, um, but then they could reopen. So it was nothing like, nothing like COVID. Um, but then we've also had um, the, the 1918 um, the 1918 pandemic, which was uh, worse than, than COVID. And that all of them seem to come from antigenic shift events. So the other thing that keeps our attention about influenza is this antigenic shift between the human strains we think about and the avian or bird strains of influenza. So bird flu, highly influenza or highly um, pathogenic avian influenza. Um, this is a big deal for two reasons. One, in agriculture, it can wipe out a poultry industry. Um, I haven't kept up with this, but I remember when I was first looking into this about 10 years ago, um, it's easy to find examples where a country has had to wipe out all the farms in a region. Um, every chicken farm, every turkey farm, every duck farm, they have to kill all of the birds to prevent this from spreading. Um, and so that causes obvious hardship and economic losses. From a human health perspective, we are concerned about how pathogenic they are. Now, they don't normally affect, infect humans. Most of these bird strains, we just see them spread among birds and kill birds. But occasionally when they do spread to humans, they are really dangerous. And so, for example, the H5N1, which you've probably heard of, there haven't been very many cases of it, but the cases we know about have had something like a 50% fatality rate. So when keeping in mind, we don't know about all the cases. There may have been also asymptomatic cases, but we certainly know that in small numbers of cases of a disease that does not spread from person to person, we see lots of fatalities, and that is a serious thing that keeps our attention. Um, more recently, these have all emerged, and I don't remember which one. Um, I know H7N9 right now has everyone's attention. H9N2 had everyone's attention a few years back. 
H7N9 is one we know more about now because there has been a big outbreak in China where something like 1,500 people got it. Um, <clears throat> in almost every case, they got it from a bird. So these would be people who either were raising um, birds, like raising chickens on a farm, or working on a farm around chickens, or ducks, or geese. Um, mostly that's the big risk factor for this. So it doesn't really spread from human to human. That means we do have a better sense of who, who gets it. It's not like there's a giant pool of asymptomatic cases out there. Um, so when they measure something like a 39% case fatality rate, um, they're probably not so far off from what the real number is, and it really is a risky thing if you get infected by this. There is a good chance a healthy person would die from this. So this one hasn't come to the U.S. yet, um, but there's nothing to stop it from recombining with an H1N1 strain inside someone or inside a bird and creating a brand new influenza. So again, no human-to-human -human spread for H1N H5N1, rare human-to-human -human spread for H7N9. Unfortunately, we know that it's possible um, for influenza strains of H5N1 to mutate and get the ability to go from person to person very easily. Researchers asked, how many mutations would it take to convert this into something that can spread from person to person? Um, and they answered the question. They made those mutations in one of these strains and they verified using ferrets um, that they had created a deadly strain that could spread from person to person. Um, and so that is the kind of thing that gives us nightmares because if we see how easy it was for that to happen in a laboratory, that can happen in nature um, at any time. Now these things will be rare in nature. Most of the time when a virus replicates, it just makes garbage and it replicates with mistakes. And most of the mutant viruses that appear are not as effective as the original virus. But there are rare mutations that make them more effective and these would be those. So because of this sort of thing, we need to um, stockpile influenza vaccines and um, anti-influenza antiviral drugs, like Tamiflu. Um, again, we want to stockpile these instead of using them because um, it, resistance shows up in virus strains if we use these, and we've already seen that with Tamiflu. Um, a couple things to put this in context. I just want to show you, like, what happened in 2009 with H1N1. Well, some schools closed, and some teenagers and adults were hospitalized and killed, whereas in a normal year, that wouldn't have happened. Um, babies and older people would have been hospitalized and killed in a normal year. So we would call it stealthy because it wouldn't be in the news all the time, but it was clearly unusual. Um, <clears throat> When H1N1 strains first appeared in 1918, they caused COVID-level um, disruptions. Um, they appeared during the First World War, and so that was a bigger disruption than any pandemic. But um, we saw that it was, um, again, attacking young adults. So soldiers crossing the Atlantic to go to war from the U.S. would die of influenza on the boats. Um, and if you, um, on the next slide, I'll show you kind of more about this. Just to understand that this virus caused something less than 1% case fatality rate, to our knowledge. But if it's going to spread quickly and infect 50 million people, lots of people are going to die. This might have a 30% case fatality rate. And if this starts spreading from person to person in a pandemic, then that is a worst-case scenario. Um, and that's what 
Um, that's what keeps public health people up at night. They can just imagine a lot of ways this could happen, and um, we can't stop it from happening in nature. So um, there's no point in being scared all the time that this could happen, but we do have to prepare for it because, again, we can't predict it. We just know it's possible. So the last influenza slide here is about that 1918 H1N1 pandemic. Um, we're just comparing how many people died in th three different things. During the Civil War in the U.S., roughly 700,000 people died in battles. So that was a nightmare. Um, in World War I, over a year and a half, there were something like 100,000 um, U.S. casualties, roughly 50,000 from combat, roughly 40,000 from influenza. So that is to say, this virus was killing almost as many people in World War I as um, combat. And back in the U.S., over a seven-month period, it killed roughly 700,000 people. So that was 0.6% of the population of the U.S. was killed um, by this virus over a seven-month period. It could have been worse, and it could have been better. And from that, if you read about the history of that, you'll read about anti-mask leagues and things like that, people who were as angry about everything as people are today. Um, and the same debates happened then that happen now about closing stores and closing restaurants and stuff. Um, and it was the same thing. When people were willing to make big changes and shut down some businesses and wear masks, they were able to slow it down. Um, but we don't have a lot more information about that. We're learning a lot about that when it comes to COVID. And so that will be the topic of the next video.